Welcome back to our retrospective series on Ergo Proxy. And now that the plot of the series has been discussed, let's discuss where this plot takes place. As mentioned earlier, Ergo Proxy takes place on a post-apocalyptic Earth, which has been wiped out by a massive methyl hydrate explosion several centuries earlier. Life, for the most part, has ceased on Earth, save in various small domes and scattered pockets in isolated locales, and there might be a few scavenging camps of humans roughing it in the wastes. For the most part, though, it's a barren land, which gives birth to our story. First, I'd like to briefly touch on the metaphysical settings of Ergo Proxy. Now, while some people may not like Ergo Proxy's love of dream scenes and subconscious exploration, I personally am a fan of them, as it allows the animation medium to really take charge in order to explore someone's inner thought processes and feelings. It's a good way to let us get to know characters without necessarily being having to be told how they feel. In addition, it also adds to the suspense and tension elements and the surreal element present throughout most of the show. Now, the physical settings in Ergo Proxy generally fall into two very opposite categories. They are either eerily pristine domes, which can be seen with the white color palette, the lack of grit present, and the fact that they seem oddly planned out. Very symmetrical and very artificial creations, whether they have or have not humans. The other settings that this series takes place in are wastelands in various states of decay and reclamation by nature. These can be failed domes, these can be barren salt flats, these could be windy mountains, anything really, and these scenes are always portrayed in dark and grim tones, showing that everything is dead. These two color palettes are very different, but they also convey an idea of death, and I'll get more onto that later. Now these are very different contradicting settings as well, and for this video we'll start with the former. Now the dome settlements, still in good shape, seem to be human havens. They're intended to be small paradises coddling the human race until it's safe to go outside again. On the surface, they're pristine, safe, and technological marvels, shielding humanity and ensuring that all will go smoothly. On the other hand, though, if one looks a little deeper, it's obvious they're a little too orderly. They're obviously not natural constructions. They're monuments to the ability of man to defy nature and go against it. They are sterile, strict, and quiet. Their white walls seem not only to strangle any germs, but any kind of creative or questioning thought. While they keep man safe, they also keep him in the dark and isolate him in a sort of false womb. And this is just where the domes went according to plan. In many domes, it goes even worse, as the proxies of those domes may not necessarily care for people. Take the robot dome shown in episode 10, which is a world where with no humans kept pristine by pre-programmed automatons. Or worse, take the domes of Ophelia, or say Smile Land, which saw their inhabitants either killed or pseudo-enslaved by their proxies, as a result of their proxies' own flaws. Now it's obvious that not every dome went well, as not every proxy necessarily cared for their inhabitants or their job. With this in mind, say we wanted to leave the domes, well what would we find then? In that case, we would find a sprawling waste littered with failed domes, mountainous traverses, and dangers galore. To start, the very air is poisonous enough to kill about 80% of people who just breathe it in. Those that do survive would be left to wander it aimlessly and either die of starvation, or hope to find some kind of dome or settlement to take them in, or to scavenge from. While it is a bleak waste, not all life here is dead. There does seem to be some forests and plants in certain areas, and a lucky traveler could hypothetically bounce between domes on their journey. Now these are the two kinds of settings in Ergo Proxy, and they both play off of each other perfectly to set up the quintessential post-apocalyptic dome world, and the consequences of living in it. They are both two sides of the same coin, that being the stagnation of humanity and its dire situation in a ruined world. The outside world shows the obvious death of humanity, shows the obvious death of the world. One racked by environmental disaster and destruction. A land where nothing can really live and where the gray soil harbors nothing but failure. Where people have obviously haven't been around for a while. While one may be free to do as they please here, their physical constraints placed upon them here would likely prevent them from doing anything too long. It's a land of physical and natural death. We see this in the gray color palette and the fact that there's no plant life almost anywhere. This gray skies and the gray color palette could portray nothing but death. Nothing can live here physically. The domes, on the other hand, represent a kind of spiritual, mental form of death, however. As mentioned earlier, the things which make them comfortable technological marvels also make them suffocating cradles. Such a lax and sterile environment creates a society where no one really cares about or thinks about anything really, and humanity slowly loses its natural edge and drive. While humans populate these domes, no one really lives in them. In fact, the humans themselves have been said to have lost the ability to procreate, and are more of automatons carrying out the functions for the dome in an odd way, it's more like the people exist to serve the dome than the dome exists to serve the people, as they have been reduced to cogs in a machine, run by computers and sterile logic. Adding to the sense of strangulating stagnation upheld by technological advance is the world-building facets of these domes. 
the auto revs, and the womb cysts. Now, auto revs, of course, are the androids of this world, and Romdown's people are extremely dependent on them, to the point of not being able to do basic functions without them. Check out this guy. He doesn't even know he's not on a computer, because his auto rev didn't tell him. Even more critical, though, is the womb cysts, or the womb room, as I refer to it, a tube-like structure through which more people are grown. Now, in this world, again, it's been said that people don't think they can procreate naturally. As such, the womb cyst is a workaround for this to be able to create more people. However, as stated, people are grown not necessarily because people want families or experience humanity, but because the dome needs more people to fill certain roles. In Romdao, the people need technology to even procreate. They also need government permission. And this adds another dreadful thread to the smothering blanket of the setting. Romdao is a city stuck in the hell of bureaucracy and all of its accompanying issues. There's constant governmental squabbling, and yet also constant control. The people here are not really disrespected by their government, and instead are simply encouraged to lose themselves in a miasma of consumerism and not questioning, and ignorance, and thus continue the cycle of stagnation. Adding to the idea that Romdao is a bureaucratic hellscape is the throne room, or the regent's room, which is one of the only areas in the city which doesn't use the already mentioned gray or white color scheme. It's instead a somber and earthly brown tone, and this is important because it distinguishes it from the rest of the dome. It also helps lend to the somber and oppressive atmosphere about it. Note how there's bars separating the region from his people. Note how there's statues, which I believe are computers, which in turn dictate to the people. Note how whenever someone has to go there, they sit in a small chair or stand at the far end and are dictated to. It helps convey the oppressive atmosphere of Romdell itself, and indeed its oppressive bureaucracy. It shows a people separated from their government, and a government s set apart from the higher principles which originally founded it, or at least seemingly founded it. It sets forward an idea of a people truly lost and stray, in a lost world. Its heavy religious presence, or at least pseudo-religious presence and air, also lend to the idea of how unnatural Romdao is, as supposedly this is the highest and most important room of the city, yet it feels oddly unnatural, and seemingly quite far from any higher creator, as it seems nothing more than the brain of a body slowly dying of stagnation, separated from normal life and life procedures, something which in itself is not natural. The dome cities are just another form of slow death, like the outside. And we can see this with their bright white color palettes. Now, while this color may be connected with the idea of cleanliness, it's also connected with the concept of sterility. And sterility basically means the death of small organisms. And now, while humans are not necessarily small organisms, we're made of very small organisms. Cells are the building blocks of life. Cells can be argued to be life itself. Therefore, if sterility seeks to kill cells, we can also see that the sterile color palette represents a different sort of death, and that the humans here are also living in a kind of half alive state. Now these two very different settings also complete two very different objectives. On the surface level, they set up the world as very bleak and depressing, where many things have gone wrong and where things can get even worse at any second. They serve to ground the series and feed into a sense of suspense and dread, which rope the viewer in. Everything is somehow unnatural, regardless of what setting type it is, and this uncanny factor tells us that, that this is a world in which something is very wrong, and that humanity may not necessarily have much of a place for much longer. Even the writing direction of the show feeds into this setting, as all the philosophical thought flowing about and around in various episodes add a sort of Lovecraftian horror to it, a sort of fear of the uncomprehensible. This is also aided by the fact that episodes often start halfway through, which add to the eerie air present and the fear of not understanding, or the tenseness caused by this. In line with the sense of creeping dread, there's also the original soundtrack. Unlike much of the series, the OST is actually all about subtlety. It is almost never at the forefront, and it was designed to be this way. Most of it is either slower pieces, whether they be orchestral or industrial, and are meant to creep in alongside with the atmosphere. On the topic of atmosphere, the duality of the soundtrack also contributes to this. As mentioned earlier, the physical setting is split into a physically dead world, i.e. the waste, and a mentally dead world, i.e. the domes. The soundtrack mirrors this, with a lot of its components being industrial pieces, mirroring the physical death present, and a lot of pieces having a pseudo-religious tone, adding to the spiritual component of the death of man. And it's very fascinating how the soundtrack blends these two seemingly disparate genres together and uses them flawlessly to help add to the atmosphere of the series. They have served to cap the atmosphere present, and they get the job done very well in this regard. There are some exceptions, as action scenes do use more intense pieces like prayer, and the opening is the noticeably uplifting Curie. On a whole, however, though, Ergo Proxy's OST 
is a good soundtrack, but it knows what it's here to do, and it's here to serve a background purpose. And this background purpose is what it excels at. It serves, inst instead of stimulating our conscious, which the series is very good at and apt to do, it serves to stimulate our subconscious and helps set the scene. It helps our brains fit into the world of Ergo Proxy and get situated as we let the conscious parts of the series take over. And it's very good at facilitating this. Not all of the scenes are dark, however. And this leads us to the second point of the dark settings, and that is they serve to emphasize the bright characters present, those of Vincent, Rial, and Pino. You see, during the day, no one will see a light, but at the darkest night, a light can really shine bright. By keeping the setting so dark and mellow, the light of the cast are gradually allowed to rise to the top. Keeping a grim setting while characters evolve emphasizes that the progress they have made and their agency, while also realistically establishing they cannot fix everything. It shows us the need to establish our own reason to entree, and it establishes that people can generally make do regardless of the situation and ascend beyond it. Thus, the dark settings also serve to help illustrate how uplifting the story actually is. So even if it's all dark, we can still see that there's quite a bit of light. 